It's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Scott Becker, JD, CPA. He is the publisher and founder of Becker's Healthcare and Becker's Hospital Review. He's a partner at McGuire Woods and a former board member of McGuire Woods. He's also served as chair of the National Health Practice at McGuire Woods for more than 12 years. He's a graduate of Harvard Law School and a CPA. Um, my gosh, uh, McGuire Woods has one of the best regarded healthcare practices in the world. Um, this is the most interesting time in healthcare. How long have you been in healthcare? Sure. So I've been in healthcare for about 27, 30 years now. Oh my goodness. Becker's Healthcare, we founded 27 years ago, which is in really four areas principally. And then we have a small DSO line. Uh, but, but it's hospitals and health systems, health IT, surgery centers and spine. It's founded, we're in our 27th year of conferences. We've got conferences, digital print. In the conference area, we started with a surgery center conference literally 27 years ago. You know, I started getting involved in healthcare a couple years before that. So it's literally 29, 30 years where I spent the, the huge, vast, vast majority of my professional time in the healthcare world. So let's start with what's on everyone's mind, obviously, uh, COVID-19. Um, how, how is that affecting your world as of today, Friday, um, March 13th, 2020? Sure. Well, it, it, it affects, of course, all of our worlds in a, in a totally variety of ways. Uh, when I look at it from the health system world, everybody is sort of on hunkered down mode uh, expecting a great deal more patients, great deal more challenges, trying to sort of, you know, as they talking about flatten the curve here so that the hospitals don't all get overwhelmed. We're in a spot in our country already with 325 million plus people. And to begin with, shortages of providers and health systems. So it's so a great concern when you actually see the spike up of something like this. Now, we're, of course, hopeful that this ends up being not nearly as bad as anticipated, and that it ends up being that a huge percentage of the cases are mild, and it ends up being something that in 36 days we look back at it and say, yes, it caused some damage, and we're going to have an economic recovery we have to recover from, but it's ultimately going to be okay. So that's sort of how we, you know, we try and look at this, and there's a lot of uncertainty, and uncertainty is often worse than the actual outcome. You know, you know the, uh, the, the, the great example in history is, is the London bombing, in preparation for the London bombing, they built tons of psychiatric hospitals, uh, and the fear was was relentless, and, and it turned out that the fear was worse than what happened, that when it actually happened, people sort of ultimately dealt with it fine, and those psychiatric hospitals ended up, um, you know, they found a new normal, and those ended up sitting empty. And, and so my hope is that the fear that's going on in our country is worse than the actual outcome, and then we end up being able to, as a country, as a group, uh, play through, and it's not as bad uh, as we expect right now when we really don't know, and the unknown is very scary. Howard, let me turn it back to you before I just keep on talking. No, 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 I, I'm loving this. Um, the one thing it seems like uh, Italy is showing is the breathing machines. Do you see equipment shortage? I mean, obviously, uh, professional healthcare providers, supplies, masks, gloves, that, that's uh, another uh, shortage, Joe. But what about breathing equipment? Well, this is, of course, the great concern in our country and why, you know, the, the thing that's fascinating is I think most people believe now, and this is apolitical, that we didn't have great intelligence coming out of what was going on in China. Just not a very open society, not as clear to us what was happening, and so probably didn't understand how bad it was there. And with Italy being a very open society and an elderly society, we're getting a very clear picture of the amount of people that are infected, how much you need ventilators, uh, and, and quite frankly, how much there's a shortage of ventilators in, in probably all countries. And, and so you look at this, it's almost like a war effort. How much can you, one, slow down the spread a little bit, which is all the social distancing and all the things that we're seeing in terms of crowd control, so that we do have enough ventilators as this hits a little bit harder and it hits our population harder. Um, I don't know how quickly we we're just on a different discussion with a hospital CEO about how quickly they could ramp up production of ventilators in this country, but that seems to be one of the kind of things they, they need to do and need to do fast. 
So for me, I, I love, I mean, you're, you're so intelligent. You're a Harvard attorney. You're a CPA. You're at the top of the uh, healthcare media world. Um, give us your opinion of dentistry because of all the things that you started in. I mean, you, um, you know, you started with hospitals, ASC, spine, um, but out of nowhere, you add dental plus DSO dentistry's only been five percent of the dental market, you know, in America historically. Um, how do you? What made you interested in to start covering dental DSOs? And what lessons have you learned in twenty-seven years of watching um, business business play out in uh, healthcare that you think will change uh, and be applied to dentistry? Sure. So, so uh, dentistry. I have this bifurcated straddled life of being a lawyer and a publisher, and and so have been a lawyer and a partner at a huge healthcare practice. And, and the interest in dentistry is simply one of, I find it fascinating what's going on, not necessarily, not necessarily positive or negative, just fascinating. So going back a decade or so, started to see the evolution of DSOs and dental services organizations and dentistry from our, from our, from our legal practice perspective at McGuire Woods is not insignificant. It, it's significant there. Um, there's a lot of lawyers that work with big DSOs. There's lawyers that work on dental transactions and there's lawyers that work in private equity funds that invest in DSOs and, and dental. So it's sort of more for me, it's a fascinating observational spot from that perspective, from a publishing perspective, you know, our efforts of course are, you know, they pale in comparison to what someone like you does that lives in dental dental from a publishing perspective is something that we, you know, are growing a foothold. We find it interesting. Um, it, it's, it's not, um, you know, if, if you look at the world, we have four core lines and 90% of our business comes from the hospital health IT line, hospital health system line and health IT line. And, and dentistry is one that we've been trying to see, trying to work in. We find it fascinating. We love the area. Um, but, but it's not, it's, it's more, we find it fascinating than it is. You know, we're trying to be the, the great DSO publisher. That's just not where we're at. We, we find it to be an interesting line that we're seeding, that we spend time in. Obviously, we watch it closely, and we find it fascinating. When, when did you start covering it? You know, we, we started covering it in small bits several years ago. Then at some point, we started assigning a full-time writer and a full-time writing area half to it. It's it, so now we cover it daily with our DSO. But it's, it's really been... You know, if you have a coverage of, you know, if, if 200,000 dental professionals follow you or more, you know, our, obviously the amount of people that cover us, that, that follow us is, is a, is an infinitely small portion of that. We're very focused right now. And it's not that we're pro DSO or anti DSO, but we're very focused on the coverage of the DSO niche of that niche and what's going on with that versus the entirety of dentistry. Well, um, it seems to me in my 57 years that, um, you know, when, when I was a little kid, all the pharmacists owned their own pharmacy. I mean, our pharmacist, it was just his store. Now they all went to uh, Walgreens and CVS. Um, it's, it looked like healthcare um, physicians had to consolidate to group practice just for expensive equipment purposes. You couldn't buy an expensive machine and have one guy uh, do it. Do you think a lot of the uh, forces that drove um, the consolidation of uh, physicians and hospitals is the driving same driving force in dentistry, or do you see it differently? Yeah, so it's a fascinating question. I mean, there's a couple differences in dentistry that hopefully will allow the long-term independent practice or small practice of dentistry still. I mean, the, the pauses of dentistry, at least up to a time, up to a time, people were still getting paid as dentists directly by their patients versus th through all kinds of third-party insurers. As that's evolved, it makes it harder and harder for dentists to be independent because just the sheer complication, complications of running an office become harder and harder. And so many physician practices, you, what's happened is as physician practices grow and have larger staffs, larger needs, larger technology, it, it's harder and harder for physician practices to be quote unquote independent. Just the cost and operational costs get higher and higher. In dentistry, what will drive at least a lot of consolidation, it gets harder and harder in the ambition and energy to run a small practice 
gets harder and harder to stay. So I am hoping there will remain, and there's still, you know, 70% of the dentists in the country are not consolidated into DSOs. I'm hoping there's long-term sustainability of that. And we'll but, see. But but the direction is definitely, um, I mean, you say 70%, but every uh, time a DSO grows, an individual is contracting. Where do you think it will level off? I've, I've always thought, where, where is lawyers right now? What percent of lawyers are in group practice and what percent are solo? Right. So that's a great question. I don't have the answer to that. I mean, lawyers, I think there are still a ton of independent practitioners. Then, of course, there's more and more at what are called the EMLA 200 firms, the largest firms in the world. that have anywhere from 100 lawyers up to 5,000 lawyers. What do, you so call, what do you call those? It's called the EMLA, the American Law, American Lawyer, the EMLA 200, the EMLA 100 comes really out of a business publication that follows the legal business called The American Lawyer. And, and that was famously founded by a guy named Stephen Brill, who is his own fasting publisher and, and so forth and so on. But the EM Law 100, the M Law 200, but you still have in, in lawyers in the country, there might be a million lawyers in the country, and, and there still is a great mix of big firm, small firm. But it, what, what, what is true is, it became harder and harder to serve the larger companies as a small lawyer. So why um, we, we don't see any publicly traded DSOs. You have these huge DSOs that have gotten a lot of private equity. Why do none of them ever want the, the public equity markets in NASDAQ? Well, it, it, it's a great question. And a lot of it has to do is where is the money? So at least in, in current times, Private equity over the last 20 years has grown to have such a huge percentage of the money that's available out there. So in, in, in the old days, there were just a handful of private equity funds. Now there's hundreds of them. There's five or seven of them, the Apollo, the Blackstones, um, you know, and, 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 and so forth that have 200 billion plus to 500 billion in assets under management, huge dollars to put to work. And so what's happened in the, in much of the practice management business, the last 10 years is when a private equity fund invests in a DSO, that DSO grows with them. Then if in the old days, the dental practice management company or the PPM practice management company would go public as an exit, that was the way of the world 20 years ago. And, and for you and me and people our age, we remember used to be 30 publicly traded practice management companies of which in the last downturn, 25 to 27 of them essentially went broke. What's happened here, private equity has been holding so much money that when a private equity fund is ready to transact with the DSO that they own, they have almost always been selling the last several years to another private equity fund. And that has just been a more attractive exit than has been the public markets. So, so where's the money? The, the money's, there's just more money in private equity than going through all the Wall Street um, stuff you're saying. Um, so we're, we're looking at an economic contraction. Um, I, um, how old were you in 1980, if you don't mind me asking? Right. So 1980, I was 16. Uh, but, but he has seen and, and lived through the 87 contraction, certainly lived through the 2008 situation, Remember first sort of the 97 situation, you know, and, 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 and have a lot of, you know, and, and, and saw, for example, you know, my, one of my defining moments was, you know, it's almost like the movie Risky Business when the company that my father worked for, a large ladies clothing manufacturer went broke uh, and my father was out of job and I was a junior in high school and it, and it really became very clear that for college, I was going to the local state university, which is a magnificent, you know, university, University of Illinois, but it really, it, it ended up where I had no choices but that because that was the, fa the fi family's financial situation. Um, so at least I've lived through some of it um, and, and we'll see how bad this gets. This is a little scarier in that it's not a simple fix at the sort of um, money supply spot, which 2000, seven, eight in hindsight feels like, because you fix the money supply, everything else worked. This is going to be a little bit more devastating because it's all kind of small and mid-sized businesses that are going to end up, you know, that are running paycheck to paycheck. that are going to end up in a lot of trouble in a short period of time. It's also a little more frightening this time 
because our country has gone so well economically the last several years that it again has levered up so much that now you have all kinds of companies and practice management companies included that, that, it, that at one point might have been, um, you know, had, a, had a, a, a ratio of earnings to debt that was rational that will now look very leveraged. And during a contraction, you're saying that small and mid-sized business um, will have cash flow issues uh, during a contraction. How, what about the DSOs? Um, they're highly leveraged, um, and they're leveraged with private equity money. How will their um, cash needs be met during a contraction? Do you, th- um, do you think it'll be an opportunity? Will they'll, they'll seize uh, small and mid-sized dental offices and grow ex- uh, um, um, scale? Or do you think they'll have to contract and shed off a lot of non-performing assets? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great, great question. So a lot of the small and mid-sized dental practices are not over leveraged themselves. So if you're an individual practitioner and you've ran your practice well or a small practice you've ran your practice well, if you've been careful, not built the most beautiful place, not over leveraged yourself with all the new cool equipment and stuff like that, you're probably going to be pretty healthy you're going to see a downturn in patients over the next few months just because everybody's going to try and avoid anything where they've got to have hand-to-hand contact for a period of time. So you're going to see some downturn for some time. We're hoping you're not seeing literally closing for a month or two where a small dental practice has to still pay their bills, pay their employees, pay their staff, but not have patients and cash flow coming in. But, But let's assume you'll see some downturn. But a lot of the small practices hopefully will be somewhat resistant to that because they're not so fragile because they've not taken on so much debt. So that's, that's sort of premise one. Premise two deals with the big DSOs. In the big DSOs, and we're starting to see this in other practice management companies, some of the other practice management companies, you know, the playbook of a private equity fund and the multiples have gone crazy the last several years is we buy a large practice at, let's say, a 10 times EBITDA. But what we're really doing is we're putting up, you know, 40% of that in equity. We're leveraging it at 40 to 50% in debt, so at a five times EBITDA or something like that. And then maybe the dental practice is holding on to some of it going forward. And, and so the debt on some of these things is at historically highly leveraged amounts. And, and many of them are based on projections. So, for example, they're, they're go, lending go, today. Go, go through the math one more time. They're buying um, – big DSOs are buying dental practices at 10 times EBITDA and what else? 40% stock? L- let's use a simple example of a okay. DSO that has earnings of $10 million a year just for simplicity. So it's being valued at $100 million. That $100 million comes in three principal ways. It comes in forty million in equity from the private equity fund, forty million in debt from a lender, and another, you know, twenty percent, let's say, is being held by the existing dental platform. So now the existing dental platform post deal of the equity that's in it owns twenty million of the sixty million, and the lender's got forty million in it. And and, and so what happens is you're typically talking at practices that never had leverage at all, never had debt on them at all. If they had debt on them, they had very small amounts of debt. Now you're looking at a practice. As long as it keeps on making 10 million bucks a year, it's leveraged at four times EBITDA and it's kind of okay. Now let's say that dental practice goes through three months where patients stop showing up. Now, instead of that dental practice making 10 million a year, it's making five million a year. Now it's leveraged an amount that's eight times EBITDA, and that's not an acceptable amount for a lender. And so you've got a situation where things are much more fragile than they used to be because things are much more levered than they used to be. And so what does that mean? That doesn't mean, you know, you, you could have the, the typical situation with a small dental practice. The first and big decision is, do I want to join a DSO or stay independent? 
it, it, and that decision won't change unless that dental practice has ended up with financial challenges now and feels like they have to do something. The next decision becomes, if I'm going to do a transaction, do I want to do it with which DSO? On the DSO side, we've seen this in other sectors already. In some of the other sectors outside of dentistry, some of the big buyers of surgery centers, practices, and so forth, have already made a decision they're not buying any more practices, any more anything for the rest of this year. Like everything's pencils down for the time being. And the reason for that is what we're talking about. A lot of those companies that are buyers themselves are highly leveraged. And what they don't want to do, you know, it goes back to everything in life. When you're highly leveraged and you, and, and you only have so much cash, cash becomes king. So if you're, if you're a buyer, you're much more cautious about buying stuff right now, you know, unless you happen to be one of these private equity found funded dental practice that says, look, our sponsor is so huge. It's KKR, it's Apollo, it's Blackstone. They have so much cash that they're going to view this as a chance to buy other DSO platforms cheap because those DSO platforms are in trouble. So KKR, Apollo, and Blackstone, you'd say those are the three largest um, private equity players in the dental DSO? No, I would say those are three of the largest uh, you know, private equity funds overall. $200 billion funds sitting on a ton of capital. The, the private equity market as a whole is sitting on anywhere from a trillion five to $2 trillion to invest. And the private equity funds have huge incentive to invest. And, and they have to invest in part because they don't get their management fees on that money until they put that money to work. So a typical private equity fund gets paid 2% for managing money and then another 20% of the profits in a deal, what's called the carried interest. But the 2% is what they pay their bills on day to day. And they don't get that 2% until they put it to work. So they're incented to put that money to work. So um, let's start with KKR. They um, have a large chunk of Heartland, which is the largest DSO. Uh, what do you think their thoughts are on that? What do you think their long-term strand, uh, plans are? I, I think someone like KKR, and, and I can't speak directly about Heartland, but, but someone like KKR has enough money that says, we could play through this and ultimately, probably, if things continue to go okay for Heartland, view that as a chance at some point to pick up other dental platforms that found themselves not operating well or, or fragile because of too much debt. That would be my perspective on somebody with as much money as KKR back in something. Um, do you think, um, what, what do you, but what do you think their long-term plan is though? I mean, how long do you think they'll stay in there? They're also, I see them, uh, aren't they involved with Henry Schein one? Right. So, so the, 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 what's happened with the KKRs of the world, the Carlisle's of the world, the Blackstone's of the world is, they have so much money, and what's happened in our world is as follows. If you went back 15 years ago, there were about 6,000 publicly traded companies in the world. Now there's about 3,400 to 3,500 publicly traded companies. And, and what this is- From what year, entire, what year was 6,000? I, I, I can't give you an exact date on it, but well, let's use for practical purposes 15 years ago. Okay. And, and so what's happened is, You've had this huge contraction, and this is part of the understanding for people of why private equity has taken over the world. There's this, this huge contraction in the number of public entities invested. At the same time, you know, the typical people that invest in private equity funds are pension funds, insurance funds, and so forth. Pension funds throughout the country, particularly huge state pension funds, hospital endowments, or excuse me, college university endowments have been growing over the last decade to two, to, to huge numbers. At some point, like the social security system, those big state pension funds will go the other way and have to pay out. But what's happened over the last decade is the huge private, private equity funds, if it used to be that a huge private equity fund 
had $5 billion in assets under management. That's the term that's used. Now the hugest private equity funds in the world might have $200 billion in assets under management. So the amount of money that they're sitting on, funded by state pensions, funded by insurance companies, funded by university endowments, is so large. And that money has to go someplace. So if you, if you look at this, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that would have gone into hundreds to thousands of publicly traded companies, the university money, the state pension funds, the other money. Now, that's just not a vehicle. It's why you hear in our world, there used to be in the 60s, the nifty 50, there were always some stocks, there was always some stocks that were the Dow, there was the stocks of this. Now you hear so much, it's consolidated around what people call FANG, or the five to seven hospitals, that have a, uh, five to seven companies that have a trillion dollar valuation. And it's not because those companies are doing well and they're doing fantastic well, but the flip side is, there are only so many publicly traded companies for private equity money to go into. Thus, private equity, there's, in, in contrast to the 3,600 publicly traded companies, there's about eight to 9,000 companies that private equity funds have invested in. So if you want equity exposure today in a real way, a lot of it goes into private, not just public, you know, not just public companies. And these funds have so much money. And so it goes into dental, goes into everybody's. They need places to find it. It's driven up the valuations of these things. And side by side, it's driven up the debt on these things. So it's made them more fragile. Howard, let me talk. Let's stop for a second to let you interject with questions so I keep this focused for your audience, not all no, of you No, I'm not going to stop a Harvard attorney at the top of his game. I, um, the, the stat is in 1996, there were 7,322 domestic companies listed on U.S. stock exchanges. Today, there are only 3,671. So it's been cut in half. So you're saying with less domestic companies um, publicly traded to invest in, that this is kind of the macroeconomic driving force of private equity, of a need to for a place to park money? That's exactly right. There's only, it's, 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 it's at the end of the day, and it takes a long time to see this. I wish I understood it 10, 15 years ago, but there, there's only so much supply and demand, and there's so much money that these are sitting on, and they will continue to sit on so much money because you know these huge state pension funds are still growing. They're not yet hit the curve where they're paying out versus growing. And those are the biggest investors for the huge private equity funds. Then it goes down to insurance companies, to college and university endowments, and so forth. So, so none of us really understood, I never really understood, CalPERS, the California pension system, and these other things, until I understood their interplay with the private equity universe and how much that's grown the last you know, five to 10 years. Do you think um, do you think the blind passive investing uh, tool of ETFs, uh, exchange uh, traded funds, uh, so many people just you know they routinely just put this in index funds and they don't really uh, have any thoughts on where it's going, what it's going to do. And do you, do you think this is having a, a perverse market effect? I don't think that it's really having a perverse market effect. I think what, what what's really happened is because there's only so many public traded companies. You, you and I grew up at a time when a good multiple for a company was eight, you know, eight or nine or something like that. that was a publicly traded company, it might be eight, 10, 11, something like that. Now the public markets, until this crash, were at 19 times earnings. And 19 times earnings is by tradition and history a ridiculous number. But it's partly because there's no place else to put money. And when the interest rates on debt are historically low, it even pushes for people further towards equities because there's no place to put money and get any return. So you think about a nation of savers, which is what we should be, and a nation of retirees. If you're a retiree and you had done a great job of saving money and saved a million dollars, in the old days, you can make 5% of that money and between that and Social Security, have a life and be okay, be able to pay the bills. And not great, but be okay. If you had more savings, could spend it down at you know twenty thousand dollars a year, and have enough money to live and maintain a nice lifestyle. Now, what's happened is if interest rates are not even talking about this week, but two percent, that million dollars somebody put away generates twenty thousand dollars a year after taxes twelve thousand a year, and it's led us to be a nation of pr public equity investors and equity investors because there's so little return on the interest rates, and, it, and it's a it's a debacle that's been going on 
for multiple different presidencies now. It's not new with President Trump. Obama was guilty of this. Alan Grant Greenspan was guilty of this. We've sort of turned into a nation of spenders and speculators versus a nation of savers, and it, it's a challenge. So um, let's uh, – we're never supposed to talk about religion, sex, politics, or violence, but we're both in healthcare. Um, I want to ask you a big macroeconomic question. You, you, you're such a major player. Why do the 19 richest uh, countries uh, endorse uh, socialized medicine, Medicare for all, whereas in the United States it is a incredibly uh, toxic trigger button? I mean, um, what, why, why, why the dis- – I'm, I'm not debating whether it's right or wrong, but why is it so different? Yeah, no, it's 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 a it's a fascinating, fascinating situation, and and I sort of go back to, oh my goodness, access, cost, quality, and and, and I'll take you through this because I think you're right. We're thinking about the problem we need to solve to get to what the right system and how to pay for it is. When I look at our country, and this is even pre this COVID nineteen thing, you look at this access, whether you're rich or poor is becoming incredibly challenging. And this is before the coronavirus. So for example, if you need a specialist in something, increasingly in our country, to get to the right specialist, you have to know somebody to get to that right specialist. I mean, it's just, it's, and you think about access, that's at the highest level for specialists. When you think about access day to day, you know, increasingly, if you're in rural areas, there's not enough access. If you're in urban areas, there's more access. But overall, with a nation of 325 million people and people living a lot longer, we've got increasing access problems at every level. Rich, poor, whatever race, religion, identity you are, increased access problems. Then you talk about quality here. Quality here is pretty good. It's not, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Um, it's, 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 of course, you find pockets where it's much better overseas, but in trying to provide quality to 325 million people, I think our lucky stars that we're not a nation of a billion people. Uh, that just seems to me, China, India, and so forth, nearly becoming an impossibility to provide access and quality to, to a billion people hard enough with 325 to 340 million people. Then you look at the cost, and the cost is expensive, and I don't know way around that. As much as people talk about it moving towards technologically a business, it is still a very hands-on, hands-on, labor-intensive business. And we all talk about better efficiency, but when somebody is sick, we all want a doctor to talk to. When you want to go see the dentist, dental hygienists do a magnificent job, dental therapists do a magnificent job of sort of extending ourselves. But we all ultimately want the dentist as well. We also want the extenders, we want everything, and they're just in lots of places in our country, massive and growing shortages, even pre this COVID-19 thing. So then I talk about how is it paid for? And the discussion has become so politicized that it's almost impossible for anybody to think without reacting. Um, on on, On the one hand, you get to a spot sooner or later, you know, and, and we're, whether you're rich, poor, white, not white, whatever gender, whatever the ethnicity you are, at some point, the middle of the electorate at least wants a public option. Because the great nightmare now is being less than 65, but not having a full-time job and having to get insurance in the market. Then you've got sort of one choice. So if you look at it from one part of the electorate, even if you're a small dental practice, you have one or two choices in most states you're in. You have no control over them. You've either got Blue Cross, United, Signet, and depending on what state you're in, in terms of your own practice insurance for your employees. And so even the middle of the electorate wants a public option. The, the fascinating thing is on, on the right, they say just let the free market work. And the reality is even in a free market, 50% plus of health care is being paid through the Medicare and Medicaid. And in an increasingly complicated patchwork, but at least the Medicare side of it kind of works. The flip side is on the left, they just shout, Medicare for all, we don't care what it costs, like it doesn't matter. And the reality is somewhere in between. We obviously need to find a way to take care of everybody. We just do. The the right side issue of ignore the issue 
doesn't really work anymore to my sense. There's just too much of an overwhelming discussion of this to make that keep on working. The left side issue of this, which is it's all class warfare, also doesn't work. And so there's got to be someplace in the middle, like on so many of these issues, that somebody aside from party lines could say, this is kind of what we need and how do we get there? But what's happened is all these things have become so crazy politicized that we can't get there. So to go back to your question, and I, I do a horrible job of going on segues, Howard, and I apologize. No, I love it. But to go back to your question, you have the people on the left that say, well, look, they do it in Norway. They do it in Scandinavia. They do it in Germany. They do it in England. And, and they do, and it's true. And, and, and many of them don't have health systems that we would envy. And, and I'll, 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 I'll separate out the Norways and Scandinavians of the world where they're taking care of three to five or 10 million people versus England, Canada, Italy, Germany to an extent, though Germany's done a pretty good job with this, but to say it is much easier to do this for five to 10 million people versus the 325 million people that we have here. They're very different numbers in terms of cost. The other thing that we have here, and I'll go back to the original point, we have a horrible access problem here that's growing. We need more doctors, we need more providers, we just need that, and we need them specialists as well as primary care. And you need to have a system that still incentivizes doctors to get through medical school. We've got to make med school a little shorter. We've got to make residency a little bit shorter and, and get people into our fields as doctors and healthcare professionals because you've got to solve an access problem. If you cut down what you're paying doctors and physicians through Medicare for all in hospitals, well, we're going to exasperate our access problem. But so at some point you need a public option. At some point, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point, I don't know when, I don't know where, I'm not an advocate one way or the other, but you might end up with Medicare for All. Medicare for All certainly is, it, it, it is, it is negative from the perspective if all of our dentists had to survive on Medicaid, we would have no dentist. You follow me? But, but so, so the, the complication is, at some point, we certainly need a public option. Do we need Medicare for all? It's a great, great question. And, and at what time will we get there? But, but, but you the say it, sh- it, w- it wouldn't cover dentistry. Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't, I don't know where dentistry would fit into it. Obviously, I just don't know. I mean, it's a great question. Medicaid programs largely cover it. But if more and more dentists had to rely solely on Medicaid, depending on what state they're in, it would be a disaster. Well, I mean, we, we the, have- the, the one the one thing I don't understand about um, when when people talk about other countries, like they'll say, you know, Denmark does this and and Norway does this, and Norway has less people than the state of Arizona. Um, I they're always talking about these very small business models. I I'd want to see the other extreme. I mean, China's got a one point four billion people. India's one point three six. Um, uh, Indonesia's two hundred and seventy million. Um, you know, Pakistan's two hundred and sixteen million. Brazil's two ten. I do, I don't see any examples coming from countries that have more than a hundred million people. Yeah, you you have a crazily challenging situation. I mean, you and I probably grew up in an era we're very much a believer in economic freedom that things get done when people are individually motivated as well as groups are motivated and so forth. And under a system where everybody works for Amazon, everybody works for Facebook, everybody works for the U.S. government, none of those are good long-term outcomes in terms of personal freedom and economic freedom. And whether you call it the thousand points of light or whatever you call it, none of those are great systems. But what what I, I do know, in addition to the question that people raise is, when you look at these other systems in Europe, for example, where people point to them as, hey, those are good systems, what and, 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 and obviously, I agree with you so much. You can't compare us to Denmark, where they have 5 million people and we have 325 million. You just can't make that comparison. What, what I think is also lost on people is, for all those countries in Europe with, with socialized medicine or some kind of socialized medicine, and, and it's not that I'm for or against it. There will be losses in our system from it, but there will be benefits too if we end up in that situation. What they don't remember is, the U.S. and this is not nationalist talk. I don't want to. I don't want to offend anybody. We are subsidizing all those countries to the tune of billions and billions of dollars a year in sort of in, in sort of military protection, which is which is you could say that they're very different issues, and they are very different issues. But it's a lot easier in another country to be able to afford something if a different part of your budget is being subsidized hugely by our country. 
And and that's not that's not an issue that we shouldn't subsidize that, but it's it's part of the the more complicated dissection of all these issues when people make these comparisons of I mean, what happens on one hand, I've seen both sides of this. Bernie Sanders says the most honest thing in the election is I have no idea what it will cost, but we have to do it. And w- what I mean by honest is saying I have no idea what it will cost. On the flip side, I've been on panels recently with, you know, former Secretary of Department of Health and Human Services, Tom Price, who I love as a person, and says, no, 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 we, we don't need to do anything. We just need to let the free market work. And the reality is somewhere in between, but we can't lose sight of the fact when you make these comparisons, those are imperfect systems. Some of them have some greatness to them. Some of them don't. Germany specifically has some really positive things to their system that I've seen firsthand. Uh, the flip side is we are subsidizing those countries billions of millions of dollars. So you got to figure out where does the money come from if we decide to go Medicare for all, and how do we solve the problem of access if we went that direction? Because we don't have enough providers as it is. Howard, I will shut up for a second. I'm sorry. So let's go back to dental DSOs. If someone was listening to you right now and, and they were a young kid and they said, I want to learn more about financing EBITDA, this whole DSO business model, what what resource would you give them to read? Sure. And that's a great question. Obviously, at Becker's Healthcare, we follow DSO situation daily, short, concise news on DSOs. And, and, and so they obviously can go there. I, I don't have other great sources. I've seen over the years great sources. What you do, I mean, is, is, is the greatest source for the dental community uh, of any place. And so, you know, if, if, if uh, you know, Dental Town, what you do, I mean, you're by far the, the, the sort of world's leading expert and connector on dentistry and DSOs and so forth. I mean, there's some other smaller publications. You know, there's a guy that constantly sends us stuff who's brilliant on the DSO side. He's negative DSO, but he's brilliant. He's got great insight into it. Who's this? Um, I, I, I'm spacing on the name. I see he sends me an email almost what, daily. What's, what's wrong with DSOs? What what state is he? Is he from New Mexico? I believe so. Okay, so <laughs> I guess I'm on the same email list. That's awesome because it's all competition. Well, it, 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 you know, the Catholic Church had the devil's advocate. the The person was to argue the opposite side, regardless of what they thought. In, in, in for good or bad, I find him to be largely on point, whether I agree with him or not. And, you know, and it's our audiences, you know, he, he's, he's, he's a smart, smart person. And whether I agree with him 100% he's a very smart guy. And, and again, no one covers dentistry like you do. I mean, you're the, the guru of this. So if anybody who wants to learn is a dentist, what's going on in the world of dentistry, they got to follow you. Well, thank you for that. But do you think maybe you'd ever write an article for Dental Town or an online hour course explaining this, uh, you know, going slower through the math of the EBITDA, all this stuff? Um, do, do, you, do you think you would ever consider that? We're, we're happy to do it. We're happy to do a more focused podcast with you around just DSOs and multiples and the business and so forth. And, and quite frankly, today, there are a couple of my colleagues, Bart Walker in our Charlotte office, who's better on the specific math of it, uh, and there's some of our writers that cover it day to day that are that are better on the details of it than I am, you know, it, but yes, we would love to, of course. Yeah, put put it in contact, because it's very interesting, because especially the older guys who are selling the DSOs, I mean, that grew up with Warren Buffett, who uh, doesn't believe in EBITDA and thinks it's, uh, you know, he, I mean, Google Warren Buffett and EBITDA, he doesn't have anything good to say about it. In fact, it's his biggest red flag to run, if you even say that word, um, but do you think that's changing? Um. I, I'm sorry, Howard. I I, I missed the question there. For oh, a second. you know, when when you start talking about EBITDA, if, if you're old school, if you're over fifty and you grew up with Warren Buffett, I mean, you know, he doesn't have anything nice to say about anybody who even looks at that metric. Why, why do you think Warren, old school Buffett, um, cannot stand that concept? Well, and I, and I don't think that um, you know he was again. It's it's so funny because you and I have so many of the same reference points because we're the same age range and stuff like that. You know, if, if you went back a generation before that, it was the Benjamin Graham School of Investing, the total value play view of investing. And so his idea was we'd only buy things that were underpriced. And then he went through a period of time where he was buying things that were underpriced. First, he was very crazily successful with it. Then, of course, he got killed on that. So he sort of moved beyond just underpriced and total value investing like the old ones. Profit school and adjusted his rules to be value plus. And the value plus became things like, do they have a great brand? Is it like a Coca-Cola, a Seas Candy, an Apple, something else, a great brand? 
that took them beyond just a value play, but long-term cash generation. And so he talks about, does the business generate cash or not? And again, EBITDA, when it's used right, is really some variation of that. EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And so at the end of the day, when EBITDA is used right, it's a variation of cash flow investing and Warren Buffett had moved towards what I think of as cash flow investing plus. Does he have a great brand that will generate cash for a long time? Is it managed healthily and so forth? And obviously, um, you know, Warren Buffett and his investment in, what was it, the 3G, the huge food conglomerate, got caught sideways on this where he invested in something that was a brand plus cash flow, uh, but then over levered and so forth. You know, and it's, uh, so, so I don't know, but I do know EBITDA when used right is a, is a, a derivative of cash flow. And it's the same thing as always, you know, it's like, you know, you see companies that are over levered, the people that will hopefully survive through this next contraction are hopefully everybody, but particularly those that did not over lever in their personal lives or over lever their businesses. Howard, I've got to run yeah. at a moment because I've got to get on another yeah. call and hey, I apologize. Any, anytime uh, you or your team want to come back on the show, uh, like I said, there, there's not many, I can't think of many people I can podcast that know, uh, it can explain the DSO model, the EBITDA, the financing, the private equity, the details of that. Um, if you have any resources, I want to come back in the show or write it in print that I can put in the magazine website or push out on social media. Or uh, or if there's anything that you ever do at Becker's, uh, Becker's uh, your website, and the website is um, you have to um, – um, I, I don't go to, uh, go to Becker's Dental. I mean, how do you – it's Scott yeah, Becker. Yeah, no, that works. Becker's if you, Dental. If you, go to, if, you, if you go to Becker's Dental, you'll find us. It's a great privilege. I love what you've done in, in, the, in the dental area and professionally. You're, you're literally uh, the kind of person that inspires us. So we're so thankful for you having us on today, Howard, and just a great pleasure. Thank All right, you, well, you can always come back on the show anytime you want. So have Thank a great you day. Thank you very, very much. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. 